What's common between Stonehenge, Prozac, homeopathy, and vertebroplasty? The simple answer is all of them are examples of placebo effect. In this video, we'll find the what, how, and why of this amazing phenomena. So, without further ado, let's get started. In September of 2008, archaeologists from Bournemouth University UK, who were actually probing the secrets of Stonehenge, made a startling claim. It was the magical qualities of these stones which made it a place of pilgrimage for the sick and injured of the Neolithic world. So basically, people who were sick and injured would come here, they would bathe these stones with water, and they would take the same water and take a bath or shower with that, and this would relieve their sickness. Now, across cultures and countries and civilizations, we have seen similar kind of phenomena. People who are in pain take a arduous and hard and long journey to the places of pilgrimage. You go to a certain place when you are in pain, and upon reaching there and doing some rituals, you get cured of your sickness or injury, either physical or mental or both. Now, we all know, for example, the stones of Stonehenge have no magical properties, but it's the belief that people have in them. It's the belief that people have in different places of pilgrimage. The belief that, yes, by going there and doing these rituals, I'll get rid of my sickness or injury, actually cures these people. Next, let's talk about Prozac. Now, let's talk about Prozac, the first ever antidepressant drug which was launched in 1988. As a psychotherapist, Dr. Erwin Kirsch assumed that antidepressants were effective. He himself used to recommend his clients a prescription of these drugs. Sometimes the condition of his depression-prone clients improved, sometimes it did not. Dr. Kirsch wondered if this is due to something else than just the active ingredients of these antidepressants. So in 1998, Dr. Kirsch published a meta-analysis on antidepressants in an online journal of the American Psychological Association. Uh, so what's meta-analysis? Basically, they just compiled all the publicly available clinical studies on antidepressants, some of which favored Prozac and its cousin's effectiveness, and some of which refuted it. So they just combined all of them and analyzed the data. What surprised Dr. Kirsch was how small the drug effect was. 75% of the improvement in the drug group also occurred when people were given dummy pills with no active ingredient in them. Obviously, it drew a lot of criticism from certain pharmaceutical companies. To respond to these critics, Dr. Kirsch decided to replicate his 1998 study with a different set of clinical trials, i.e. the data from FDA. The main benefit of using the FDA data set was that Dr. Kirsch had now the data of unpublished trials as well as published trials. This turned out to be very important. Almost half of the clinical trials sponsored by the drug companies had never been published. Why? Well, most of them failed to find a significant benefit of the antidepressant drug or placebo. So obviously, the drug companies didn't make the clinical trial results public. Only 43% of the trials showed a statistically significant benefit of the drug or a placebo. The remaining 57% were failed or negative trials. The results of this new analysis indicated that placebo response was 82% of the response of these antidepressants. Thus, when published and unpublished data are combined, they fail to show a clinically significant advantage for antidepressant medication over inert placebos. Now, how is it possible that medication with such weak efficacy data were approved by the FDA? The answer lies in an understanding of the approval criteria used by the FDA. The FDA requires two adequately conducted clinical trials showing a significant difference between drug and placebo. But there's a loophole. There's no limit to the number of trials that can be conducted in search of these two significant trials. Trials showing negative results simply do not count. In his book, The Emperor's New Drugs, Dr. Kirsch goes on to explain that these so-called antidepressants were discovered by accident. These drugs were basically used for the treatment of tuberculosis. Some tuberculosis patients reported that they felt better after taking these drugs. So, drug companies just decided that these drugs were antidepressants. For 99% of the cases, it's simply 
does not matter what is in the medication. It might increase serotonin, it might decrease serotonin, or it might have no effect on serotonin at all. The effect on depression is basically the same. So yes, Prozac works, but it works because of placebo effect and not because of the active ingredient. Next, let's talk about homeopathy. Homeopathy was founded by Samuel Hahnemann, a German physician. He practiced medicine from 1781 to 84. He wasn't very happy with the state of medicine in his time, particularly the practice of bloodletting. It would take 50 years after his death that the medical community accepted the germ theory, the theory that most diseases are caused by small microorganisms called germs. So in his time, medical practitioners didn't have that knowledge. So medical practice was very much hit and trial. Obviously, Honeyman wasn't happy with the situation and he had other talents. He was very proficient in a lot of languages. So he quit his medical practice, making his living through writing and translating. During one of his translation works, Hahnemann encountered the claim that the bark of cinchona tree was effective in treating malaria. He ingested some cinchona tree bark and noted that it caused symptoms very similar to malaria. So from his personal experience, he then theorized that a curative substance such as cinchona, when given to a healthy person such as him, it might cause symptoms of the disease being treated. Like cures like. And so this became the first principle of what he called homeopathy. Homeo from Greek means similar and pathy means suffering. The same thing that causes the disease can also cure it. Also, he named the existing medical practice allopathy. So the first major law of homeopathy, like cures like. So basically, for example, cutting onions makes your eyes watery. According to Hahnemann, these onions can also be the cure of watery eyes. Now let's come to the second law, also known as the law of infinitesimal dose. What it says is that a solution that is more dilute is described as having a higher potency, considered to be stronger and deeper acting than less dilute solutions. So let's say we isolated the onion extract and what we do is now we do a process called homeopathic dilution in which a substance, for example our onion extract, is diluted with alcohol or distilled water and then vigorously shaken in a process called succussion. Honeyman believed that the process of succussion activated vital energy of the diluted substance and that successive dilutions increased the potency or the effectiveness of the preparation. Now Honeyman created the C scale. At each stage you dilute the substance by a factor of 100. Now, what is 2C then? 2C means 100 times 100, so 10,000 times. By the third dilution, 3C, onion extract to liquid ratio is 1 is to 1 million. Honeyman advocated 30C dilution for most purposes. That is a dilution by a factor of 10 to the power 60, which means a million, 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 million million parts of water or alcohol to one part of the active substance in our case the onion extract so he believed that 30c dilution is okay but he regularly used dilutions up to 300c now in Hahnemann's time it was reasonable to assume that you can just keep diluting a solution infinitely because the concept of atoms was just not there we now know the greatest dilution that is reasonably likely to contain one molecule of the original substance is 12C because of Avogadro's constant. So Honeyman advocated 30C. If you look at it, in the final diluted solution, there's nothing left of the drug. And that's where homeopathy fails logic. Various research organizations have taken homeopathic medicines from the market and they have seen it under the microscope. They have tried to find the active ingredients they couldn't find anything. Take for example oxylococcinum, a homeopathic medicine very popular in Canada. If you go to the website it says 200C 
anything beyond 12 C means you have already lost the last molecule that could be possibly present in the solution. Now think about 200 C. Even if you mix one molecule of our onion extract with all the atoms in our solar system, it will still not suffice to make a solution that's diluted to 200 C. So basically, this logically inconsistent idea that more you dilute an active ingredient in water, the more powerful it becomes in treating a disease, makes homeopathy totally ineffective as a proper medical system. But at the same time, we also know that homeopathy is used by millions and millions of people every day and they feel better. People in my friend circle, people in my family, uh, the Queen of England, celebrities, they have used homeopathic medicines and found it effective. What's going on? And that's where the third principle of homeopathy comes into play. The third principle by Honeyman was an illness is specific to the individual. What does that mean? Well, I heard from people who have been to homeopathic doctors and who have taken homeopathic remedies that the first session is usually very long. It can last anywhere between 30 minutes to 2 hours. And that's where the healing power of homeopathy lies. Because the patient sitting with the doctor and the doctor listening for two hours, giving them comfort, talking about their past history, giving emotional support, that will give the patient enough faith in the doctor. Even if the doctor gives the patient sugar pills, the patient is going to think it is a cure. So basically, yes, homeopathic medicines cure problems, but it's not the active ingredients of these medicines. It's rather the trust the doctor gains with the patient in the first two-hour consultation. That works as the placebo. So in simple words, placebo effect can be summarized in a very simple equation. The first thing we have is real pain. Everybody who went to Stonehenge, everybody who takes antidepressants and homeopathic medicine, they have real pain. Plus, we get some false information about the effectiveness of something that has no real active ingredients and no objectively verifiable healing power, which creates self-healing. So, we can summarize false information plus real pain equals self-healing. Now, let's also look at where is it applicable. So, placebo effect only works when someone has physical pain or mental stress or depression. It doesn't work, for example, on cancer. It doesn't work on, for example, COVID-19. So those are the limitations of placebo effect. Now that we have a basic understanding of what placebo effect is, let's look a little deeper into how it works. The most important pillar of placebo effect is trust. The person must trust the information that he gets. The information is false. But to the person who is receiving the information, they must believe in that information. So belief is based on three things. First, rituals. There must be certain rituals that need to be completed. Second is anticipation. The person must anticipate. They must have an expectation of getting healed, of benefiting from this system. And the third thing is the settings. The rituals and the expectations must happen within certain settings. And when you have the rituals and anticipation in certain settings, the trust becomes so powerful that the person's brain releases painkillers, natural painkillers such as endogenous opiates. And these painkillers then kill the pain, be it physical pain, mental stress or depression. Then the basic question is, where does the trust come from? Because first we need to trust the system. This trust can come from two places. First is what I call personal charisma. For example, my favorite celebrity is taking homeopathic medicine and so it must work for me as well. So you follow what these charismatic people say and that way you self-heal. But more importantly, you have another type of trust, institutional trust. For example, you go to a place that looks like a clinic or a hospital. You meet a person that looks like a doctor. You wait in the lobby. You see other patients talking. Then you go through a lobby. You enter the doctor's room. You're asked to sit. You know the person that is attending me is a doctor. All these things is what we call institutional trust. Institutional trust is much more deeper 
than personal charisma. Because if your favorite celebrity is caught doing something really bad, you might lose trust. But institutional trust lives with us. We share the stories about how someone went to a hospital or a place of healing and they got healed. We spread these stories because we are social beings and that then deepens the trust into these institutional settings. So placebo effect works on trust. The more you trust, the more your body will self-heal. So we now know what placebo effect is. It's false information plus real pain leading to self-healing. And we know how it works. It works totally based on belief or trust. But then a very important question arises. If our body has the ability to self-heal depression, stress and other things, why can't we do it by ourselves? Why do we need external agents, for example, a doctor, a homeopathic doctor or a temple or a place of pilgrimage? We have this ability to heal ourselves, but we need an external agent to then start the process of self-healing. Why can't we do it by ourselves? Why did human evolution mandate an external agent for self-healing to take place? Now, we might think pain is bad, but in fact, congenital analgesia, a rare condition in which a person cannot feel physical pain, is very dangerous. Physical pain is vital for survival. It's bad for us in the moment that we feel the pain, but in the bigger picture, pain is good. But once we know the location of the problem, why don't we just automatically start producing the natural painkillers of the body, endorphins, automatically? Why do we need an external agent? Let's explore why. Now, suppose you are a caveman, and while hunting, you got pain in your knee. So, what happens next? You will not start producing the endogenic opiates, the endorphins, automatically because your system doesn't want to waste special minerals that you need to produce these things. Because this knee injury means you might not be able to hunt any further and hence not be able to replenish the supply of these nutrients in the future. Instead, the system wants to save these nutrients for emergencies, more important stuff that might come up in the next few days. So it prefers to keep feeling the pain while storing these special nutrients for emergency use. So you will keep feeling the pain until a trusty fellow caveman comes to you and says, I'll take care of you, don't worry. I'll feed you and I'll be with you as long as you want me to. Now what that does is, it relaxes your system into thinking, well, this person is going to help me. So now I can spare the vital minerals and essential things that I need to start this chemical process in my brain to produce these natural painkillers, these endorphins. And so this system then evolved in us. We now go to a trusty doctor or shaman or priest. Once this person takes the responsibility, once this person tells us, yes, everything's going to be fine, don't worry we can direct our brain to then start producing these natural painkillers. So that was today's video. In our next episode, we'll continue exploring placebo effect in surgical operations such as vertebroplasty and knee operations with a personal story on how I experienced placebo effect firsthand. Thank you for watching and as always, please like and share this video as much as you can. And if you really like this video, please don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, bye-bye.